Hey, everybody. We are going to talk about stocks that you might not have heard of yet. I know this is par for the course when I have Tyler on the show, but I'm going to do it too today. Um, before we dive into a couple of our favorite stocks that you might not have heard of, which we like to call under the radar stocks, we I'd like you to take a, li- a look at the link you see on your screen for a message from my sponsor, The Motley Fool. You get the top 10 stocks to buy right now, and it's a great way to support this work we're doing. So I'm going to start because I'd say out of the two, mine's probably the better better known. We could make an argument over who is the weirdest stocks all day long, but mine you've at least heard of the, of what they own. Uh, it's a company called Empire State Realty Trust. A lot of people don't realize that the Empire State Building is a company you can actually invest in. Um, Empire State Realty, they own the Empire State Building, their real estate investment trust. They also own a bunch of other apartment bu- or a bunch of other buildings, mostly office, mostly in Manhattan. They have some residential properties, but the office portfolio, especially the Empire State Building, is really the focus. So there's a lot of pessimism in the office industry these days, and for good reason. There's uh, Every city has a bunch of like almost vacant office buildings right now. A lot of companies either never return to you know full in-person work, have some sort of hybrid work model. A lot of companies downsize their office footprint. And that's really not happening in New York City, especially, and, it's, and really in the, in the buildings that they own. Um, just to kind of run through some of these numbers, you might be surprised to hear uh, Empire State's Manhattan office portfolio is 92.1% leased. That's 250 basis points higher than a, a year ago. So, you know, it's trending in the opposite direction of what you might expect. Um, cash NOI, uh, net operating income, is up over 11% year over year. Uh, the company's retail properties, which if you've ever been to New York City, you know that the first floor of every office building is usually retail. Um, that's also 92% occupied. Their multifamily properties are over 98% leased. Um, so really strong numbers throughout. Their tenants are proving very resilient, and their tenants are skewed toward companies that need a physical office space. Um, they have a, they rent they lease a lot to financial companies, for example. Um, they have some tech clients. I mean, uh, LinkedIn's headquarters are at the Empire State Building, uh, just to name one. Uh, they have a giant Starbucks in the Empire State Building. That's a big uh, tenant of theirs. But they have a lot of financial companies. Uh, the FDIC is a company, is a, you know, the Federal Deposit Insurance Company. They, they lease space from Empire State. That's a pretty big, um, you know, uh, need for actual in-person office. Um, one of the things that makes us really unique as opposed to other office REITs is the observatory on top of the Empire State Building, which they own and operate. Uh, it accounts for about a quarter of their revenue from about 2% of their square footage. It's a cash machine business. It's a must-do tourist stop uh, for anyone who goes and visits New York. Absolutely beautiful up there. They actually recently did a big renovation just before the COVID pandemic shut down the observatory, so they couldn't have timed it worse. Um, But they did a big uh, renovation right in 2019. Um, Beautiful observatory, and it's a source of high-margin revenue. 129 million in sales in the fourth quarter, 94 million of that was was operating profit. So very high margin business, very low cost to run. They already own the property, so they, it's not like they have to pay rent on it. Um, great balance sheet for an office REIT. They have about $350 million in cash, an $850 million unused credit line. Um, their average interest rate on their debt is 3.9%. And because of that cash, I know near-term maturities are a big focus in the office industry right now. They can actually cover all of their their maturities through the end, almost the end of 2025, with just the cash on hand if they needed to. Um, so really good margin of safety there. Trades for about ten and a half times earnings or funds from operations in real estate terms. It's not a high dividend stock, so a lot of real estate investors ignore it. Uh, it has a 1.4% yield, but that's by design. Uh, they pay out what they have to. They've been focusing on buybacks recently, not dividends, because management thinks the stock is cheap. Uh, they really started buying back stock aggressively at, when the COVID pandemic started in March 2020 and really haven't stopped since then. So uh, great capital allocation. I like that they're diversifying into residential in recent years. And just kind of a cash machine business that the observatory is, is a real big differentiator. So it's one of my biggest REITs and one that I plan to own for a while. Tyler? 
All right, so we're we're going down a, the the strange path with me again, uh, but I'm going to talk about Federal Agriculture Mortgage Corporation, um, more colloquially known as Farmer Mac. Um, if you've ever heard of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, you know the the two uh, government service entities that basically buy home mortgages uh, in the United States. Farmer Mac is the same thing, uh, but specifically for a lot of rural and agricultural uh, development in the United States. We have a thing in the US called the farm credit system. Uh, it was kind of born out of a lot of credit problems that we've had in, in agriculture over decades. And we kind of settled on this farm credit system that where where farmer mac is provides like a backstop to government uh back loan or it, they're they're like the buyer of last resort of government back loans uh specifically for farm and ranch agriculture uh rural electrification projects as well as we're starting to see some renewable energy uh projects in uh, designated rural areas um, even if you buy a home in a, a, what are considered rural parts of the united states you can actually get a farmer Mac, uh, backed, um, loan rather than like a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac back loan. Um, it, it, it sounds like a weird business. I get that. It's in, you know, you hear like, oh yeah, it's like Fannie and Freddie. Wait, weren't those the ones that collapsed during the great financial crisis and haven't come out of conservatorship? Yes, they are, but that's okay. We're going to move on from that. We're going to talk about why it's actually a good business because when we look at the kind of the loan profile of what Farmer Mac looks at. It's a lot I, I, more conservative than what we had with um, homeowner loans. Just to give an example, uh, the average loan, uh, like the loan to value for like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is about 75 to 79%, meaning like you're, you're borrowing 75 to 79% of the money to make your purchase uh, with uh, farmer Mac loans, it's closer to 40, 45%. These are closer to like what you would do for a business purchase, right? Cause you're typically, you know, buying some, uh, buying capital, uh, capital goods or something like that to, I don't know, enhance the output of your ranch or something like that. Um, and the other thing is one of the benefits for this particular business is it's kind of like a bank because basically they, they borrow from, the Federal Reserve and the other uh, farm credit banks, which are uh, a whole other system in, uh, in and of itself, they borrow from them, and then they obviously uh, buy these loans and you know collect an interest spread. It's considerably lower, but the nice thing is is that it doesn't have um, it doesn't have deposit or flight risk, which you know was has been a bit of a problem uh, in the United States the past couple of years, like what we saw with uh, Silicon Valley bank with a, de a depositor flight with that not being an issue. Um, this is a business that despite what doesn't look traditionally to be a great business, you know, low margins, buying loans, things like that. This is a business uh, it, as a stock. It is more than 10 X the market over the past 30 years. And it's a business that has a 3% dividend yield right now and over the past 10 years has grown that dividend by 25% annually, uh, you know, continually acquiring from the loan book. It has a little bit of a, a, a extra growth catalyst now because it's doing renewable energy loans as part of the uh, Re Inflation Reduction Act and a lot of the other kind of uh, gr green energy uh, initiatives going on in the United States government. It's it's a business that at very first glance, you're like, oh, this isn't a really good business. But the deeper and deeper you look at what is under the hood, you go, wow, this is really interesting and actually a business that's built to do extremely well over the very, very long term. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. Be sure to click subscribe if you don't subscribe to my channel already. And as always, this video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. Be sure to visit www.fool.com slash frankel to receive the 10 top 10 best stocks to buy now.